So before we start off, any questions? If anybody has any question, you can raise the hand. I'll take the question. All right. So let's start off. Okay, so uh, we have already talked about a uh, couple of things like EC2 we have already talked about, CloudWatch we have already talked about, SNS also we have talked about and another important topic that we covered yesterday was identity access management. Identity access management is very very important. Guys go ahead and practice identity access management then you will get the real feel of what it is, right? All right, so today we will uh, look at S3 storage, right? Today we will try to look at S3 storage and a couple of other things if possible based on the time, right? But first of all, let's start off with S3 storage. So when you log into your account, this is what you look at. When you go into a AWS console and when you click on S3 here, this is what you get to. And it says uh, Amazon S3 storage for internet and a brief description of, about what Amazon S3 storage is, right? If you uh, if you want more information about what S3 storage is, you can visit this page, right? As, as I said, every product that you have has, has a dedicated page for it, right? And it describes the features, the pricing and all the stuff, right? And normally we, you can, there's an introduction video like this, and there is a small interaction video like this. If you look at the video itself, you understand at least say, I would say 20, 30% of what, what the product is doing. And then you have to read about what exactly it is. Right? So I, I would advise you to read through this page and read through the FAQ especially. Right? FAQ, FAQ has lots of lots of information, lots of lots of important information in fact. Right? So uh, S3 storage, right? So S3 storage is an object storage, right? So there are different kinds of storages. One is called as block level storage, um, other, sto other, other storages are called as file storages, then there is something called as object storage. If you guys have ever used, say, a Google Drive or a Dropbox or a SkyDrive, right? Uh, you'll realize you, you're already using the object storage. If you guys ever used a Dropbox.com, uh, I hope you guys know what Dropbox.com is, right? Dropbox.com is a site which uh, specializes in uh, in giving uh, cloud storage space, right? And they are a multi-billion dollar company right now, okay? And all of their storage is being supported by Amazon S3 storage. So what does that mean is whenever you sign up for a uh, Dropbox.com account and whenever you upload a file, the actual file is actually stored in Amazon S3 storage. So what Dropbox.com has done is they simply developed the front-end applications, right? And the back-end storage, the main part of the business, the storage business, is, is being done by S3 storage, right? So what S3 storage is? In S3, what you do is you create you create buckets, right? You create buckets. The buckets are the place. Buckets are the initial objects in S3 where you can upload files. Buckets are nothing but they are like your file, they are like your folders. But in S3, they are called as buckets. Okay. All right. So let's look at what S3 is, what the features are, and how you uh, use it. Okay. With S3 storage, the important and main consideration is the amount of durability that you get for your data. Right. The durability of the data that is in S3 storage is 99.999%. So what does that mean is? Whenever you upload an object, whenever you upload a file, right? Here, they are not uh, files are not specifically called as files, but they are called as objects, right? That is why it is called as the object storage. Okay, whenever you upload an object or a file into a S3 storage, the durability of the file or the object is 99.99, so it, it is 11 nines, right? So what does that mean is the file that you are uploading. Uh, has a chance of losing of 100 minus 99.9 and these 11 nines. So that is very minuscule, right? It, it is as good as 
once you upload a file, you will never lose a file. Okay? Why is that happening? Because your data is, it says here, your data is redundantly stored across multiple facilities and multiple devices in each facility. So what does that mean is, once you upload a file, right? Once you upload a file, there are at least at least three copies. Right? By default, ST storage will store at least three copies of your file. So even if you lose one, Amazon will be able to get you the file copy from other storage. So that is the region. They, they say you that, uh, the durability of the storage is 99.9 and 11.9 percent, right? And and Amazon S3 storage is really cheap. We'll look at we'll look at costing also, and uh, the availability is 99.99 percent. So what does that mean? Is whenever you try to access an object, right? It is 99.99 percent time available, right? There is a difference between durability and availability. Durability is is basically the chance of you losing a file. Availability is the time. Uh, whenever you try to access a file, if it is there, it is available. If the file is not there, it is not available, right? Then you have other things like uh, security, scalability, and all of this, right? So whatever the file that you are uploading in, in a S3 storage, you can encrypt the file, right? And S3 storage is scalable. So what does that mean is S3 storage is an unlimited storage. S3 storage is an unlimited storage. So what does that mean? You can upload as many files as you want in your, and you can forget it. Those files will always be there, okay? And it can also, uh, and it, it does integrate very well with uh, SNS, right? It can also send notifications whenever you want, whenever, uh, if you want to be notified whenever there is a file is uploaded into an S3 bucket, you can configure it for that. We'll look at that shortly. You can do that. And, uh, what you can do is when you're trying to upload a law, large file, right? When you're trying to upload a large file, say I have a file of 1 TB and I want to upload it onto S3 storage. What I can do is I can do something called as multi-part upload. What does that mean is you can divide your file into multiple chunks of the file and you can upload it. That is called as multi-part upload. If you do a multi-part upload, generally the performance of upload is very fast. Okay. And it is easy to use and all of this stuff. Okay. And another, some other important features of uh, S3 storage is uh, web hosting. That means if you want to host a website, if you just want to host a website, you can host the website from an S3 bucket itself. You don't have to, you don't have to use an EC2 server also. We'll look at that. We'll look at how to host a, how to host a web server out of an S3 bucket. And it also supports something called as versioning. Like if you guys know about Git, Git or any versioning tool where you store multiple versions of the file, right? So if you guys have ever used Git, you will know what what I'm talking about, right? Version, say say I, I'm working on a file, I'm working on a file today, so I make I make some changes to the file today and upload it, and tomorrow I work on the same file and upload the second file, right? Normally, what happens in our system when we say when we say the changes? The older file is gone and the newer file is there. But with the version control software like Git or like your uh, S3 storage when you enable versioning, what's going to happen is both the versions of the files are be th will be there. So when if you want to look at, if you want to look at your yesterday's file or a file from a month back, you can always look at it. Okay, we, we will have a look at that. Then uh, S3 is a very good solution for backup and archiving. So what does that mean is? You take your data backup from your uh, from your EBS volumes, and you normally store it on S3 buckets. Because when you compare the storage cost with EBS and S3, S3 is much much cheaper. Okay, so it is always it is always a better practice or a good practice to store your backups and archives on S3 storage. Okay, all right. So we'll continue with that. We'll also look at uh, product details. Uh, you can, as I said, uh, and uh, I, I said that uh, S3 storage is an unlimited storage, right? But the only restriction is per object or per file. Per file, the maximum size is 5 TB, right? The object size cannot go more than 5 TB, but it is an unlimited storage. You can store thousands of 5 TB files. Doesn't doesn't matter. Amazon will Amazon is ready to provide you capacity for that, provided you pay you pay the bill for it. Right. Obviously, when you uh, when you are using the storage, obviously you will have to pay for it. 
we'll look at it. We'll look at it very shortly. Then uh, Amazon has the key features like uh, cross-region duplication. We'll, we'll, we'll have a look at it once we go into, once we talk about S3 buckets, then you'll probably understand. As I said, event notifications, versioning, lifecycle management, encryption, security and access management. We're going to look at each of this stuff very shortly. Okay. And what else you can do is you can interact with Amazon from a SDK. Right. As I said, there are multiple ways to access uh, Amazon S3 console. Right? We'll also try to access the S3 storage from an EC2 instance and see how to upload and download files. We'll see that today. Okay. Cost monitoring controls, all of this stuff is there. You can you can you can read this page. Right. This page has a lot of information. Right. Uh, once you read this page, if you still have any questions, you can come back to me. I, I would highly recommend you guys to re go through this page. Right. And in S3 storage, there are there are multiple storage types. When when I'm talking about S3 storage, right? In, in S3 storage, there are multiple storage types. One is called the standard S3 storage, right? These include Amazon S3 standard for general purpose storage or frequently accessed data. Then there is another storage called as Amazon S3 standard infrequent access, means for the files which you don't access very frequently, right? The only difference between uh, S3 standard and S3 standard infrequent access is the, the durability, availability, all of this is same, right? The main difference comes in the costing, right? Amazon S3 standard is a bit expensive when you compare with Amazon S3 standard infrequent access, right? So if, if, if you are sure that you are not going to access the data very frequently, say for example, I, I upload, I keep uploading reports but uh, maybe I don't look at the reports of last older than three months. Like you, you guys could have all the photos that you have taken from years, right? These days everybody has digital cameras and everybody keeps taking photos and they keep uh, piling, piling up the photos, but they, never, they hardly was the photos, right? So if, if you have some data like that, which you don't frequently access it, right? Probably that data you can put either in something called as S3 standard infrequent access, or there is an even cheaper way of storing those files called as Amazon Glaciers, right? Amazon Glacier is a tape storage solution. If you guys know what a tape storage is, say, uh, if you guys know, if you guys have ever looked at audio tape, right? It's a small audio tape where we don't use audio tapes anymore, but people used to use audio tape, right? Everybody, I think, Hopefully you guys would also see the audio tape. In a similar way, there will be a data tape, right? On the data tape, people store data. People store data on tape because storing data on tape is lot, lot cheaper than storing data on disk, right? So that's the reason people still store data on the tapes. And for tape storage, the solution from Amazon is something called as Amazon Glacier, right? We'll also try to look at Amazon Glacier today. All right, so we'll, we'll try to cover that today. Okay. And as I said, there are three classes, Amazon S3 standard, Amazon S3 standard infrequent access, and Amazon Glacier. Okay. So with Amazon S3, you get all of these features, like all the features are listed here, key features, low latency, high durability, high design for high availability, and all of this stuff. And you can also encrypt the data. Right. So with infrequent access also you get all the features. The features are absolutely same. If you look at if you look at if you are looking at the screen carefully, all the features are same. Only difference being cost. Right? And Amazon Glacier is a altogether a different storage. We'll talk about it today. Uh, and if you look at uh, the comparison, standard, infrequent access and all of this stuff, right? So uh, this durability is same. Availability is 99.99%. So what does that mean is whenever you try to access the data, 99.99% it is there. At times it is there, right? Then uh, with an infrequent access storage, the cost will include the with with S3 infrequent access. What can happen is the cost will also include whenever you try to retrieve the data, they will charge you something for it. Right? We'll we'll have a look at that. All right, so if let's look at pricing. Let's look at pricing. Uh, 
uh, with Amazon S3 pricing, it is uh, different. Till now, what we looked at was the other day. What we looked at was the pricing for EC2 instances, right? We haven't looked at any other pricing till now. So Amazon S3 has pricing in it, right? So if you look at it, Amazon S3 pricing. As I said, there are three different kinds of storages, right? Uh, Amazon S3 storage, Amazon S3 storage, infrequent access storage, and glacier storage. But the first one TB per month that you store, they charge you some three cents. The same storage with infrequent access, you get at one some cents, 1.25 cents. If you store the same data in glacier storage, it is even cheaper, right? We we'll look at that and. Price varies on the volume of the data that you're going to store. All right, so that, that's with the pricing. You can, you, you guys can go ahead and have a look at it. You'll understand more of more about pricing. So let's look at hands-on stuff. Let's do hands-on stuff. Let's see, let's use S3 buckets and see how it works, right? So what I'll do is I'll, the first thing that you have to do is you have to create a bucket. Without the bucket, there's nothing in S3 that you can do, right? So we'll create a bucket. For that, you click on this create bucket. Then it will ask you for a bucket name, right? The important consideration for the bucket name is, the bucket name that you're going to create is, the bucket name should be unique across, should be unique across the S3 uh, space, namespace. So what does that mean is, I cannot have a bucket name something like test. If, if, I am, if I'm going to create a bucket name something like test, and if I'm going to go with the US standard region, and if I'm going to click on create, right, it's going to say that the requested bucket name is not available. So if you are creating a bucket with, say, a test name, now later on if I come in and if I want to use that name, I'll not be able to use it. So every bucket that you're going to create, not only you, every every user that, that is going to use S3 storage and the bucket name that they're going to create should be unique. So I cannot use something like test or test one, two, three. Already obviously some somebody should have been, should have taken it, right? So you should go for a unique name. Let's try Collabra if somebody has taken it or not. Right? Collabra name is also taken by someone. So we'll not be able to use. So probably we'll try Collabra one, two, three. And we'll say create. So Collabra one two three. I got the bucket name, right? So nobody is using till now. So I was able to create a bucket with this name. Let's create another bucket. I'll, I want to show you a couple of things here, right? When you create, when you are creating a bucket, you have a drop down here, right? Using this drop down, you can select where your bucket, where your files are going to be stored in which region you want to store the files, right? Based on uh, the region you select, the files will be stored there. Say your standard is nothing but North, North Virginia. If you want to store, if you want to create a bucket in a different region, you can obviously create it, right? So, Colabda is already taken by someone, so I can go with Colabda 1, 2, 3, 4. I can create a bucket, right? Now I have two buckets. If I click on this, it will show me that this bucket is in your standard. Your standard is nothing but North Virginia. And this bucket is in Oregon. Okay? Let's create another bucket. Creating buckets doesn't cost you anything. If you start storing data, then you'll have to uh, pay, the, pay the money for it. Right? Uh, I'm going with your standard. And if you want to enable logging, once I create a bucket, I obviously I'm going to upload some files, and I want to keep or, or keep a log on who's accessing my files. I want to keep a log on from which IP address, when, who, how many people are accessing my files, and all of that information. Then I'll have to say set up logging. Okay. Once you select that, if you want to enable logging, right, you have to select enabled, and you also have to select under which bucket you want to store logs. Say I'm, I'm creating a new bucket, right? I'm creating a new bucket class like, uh, let's select create one, two, three, four. What's the bucket name of it? Let's, let's correct it. Collabra one, two, three, four, five is my bucket name that I'm going to create. So I'm going to say set up logging. And I have to choose 
which bucket I want to use for logging, right? If I want to have a bucket consisting of only logs, probably I'll create that bucket and I'll use that bucket only. But for now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the same bucket. Under the same bucket, I want it to create a folder by name logs, right? I want it to create a folder by name logs and I want the logs to be stored there. Okay, so I'm going to do that create. Now it's going to create a bucket for me, right? I have no, now I have three buckets, Collabra 1, 2, 3, Collabra 1, 2, 3, 4, and Collabra 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? And it says Collabra 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 bucket is empty. But we have asked it to enable logging, right? And it said that uh, it's going to create a folder by name logs, but we don't see that, right? So why is that? Because logging doesn't happen instantaneously. Logging happens with the interval of time. Nobody is sure when, but it, it happens with the interval of time. So as soon as somebody is accessing your files, then there'll be a folder here by name logs and all your logs will be stored there, okay? So let's look at this bucket. Let's look at one of the buckets that we created. And let's try to understand this interface first, right? So what you can do is if you want to create a bucket, you can click here. Like it will take you to the same widget where you can launch a, uh, where you can uh, create a new bucket. Other than that, you have actions. If you want to create a new bucket or if you want to delete the bucket or if you want to delete all the files in the bucket, we'll look at this shortly. And then you have none here selected. If you want to look at the properties of the bucket, you can click this and it will basically show you the properties of the bucket. We are going to play around with these properties and understand more about what S3 can offer you. Right? Then it will also have a tab for transfers. So if you have transferred any file to a AWS bucket, then those files will be here. Okay? If you have transferred any file, those files will be here. We haven't transferred any file, so that's fine. Okay? So let's get into this one. So what do you want to do under this bucket? You want to create a folder? I can create a folder, like say, test folder. Here under the bucket, you can have any name for your folders. But the bucket name has to be unique across the namespace. But once you create a bucket name, you can use any name as a folder, right? This is a folder. If I, if I click on it, now I am in Collabra123 slash test folder. I am in the bucket of Collabra123. Under that, I have a test folder, okay? I can also upload files, right? If I want to upload a file, I can click on that. Now it will take me to upload files. Now I can, uh, if I want to upload something, I can definitely do that. Right? I have, I have some files here. If I want to upload it, I can definitely upload it. But I'm, I'm right now trying to upload a a 2.2 MB file, collabda introduction.pdf, right? If I'm going to say, if I want to add more files, I can click on add files and I can obviously choose, right? I don't want to do, I want, I don't want to use any more of them. So I'm going to upload this PDF. Before uploading, there are a couple of things that you can do, right? And, and there is some important information being displayed here. To upload files up to 5 TB each, right? To Amazon S3, click add files. But what about if you if you want to uh, upload files more than 5 TB, right? You cannot have a file more than 5 TB. So there's no way you can upload a file more than 5 TB. Right? So what you can do is you can click on, if you want to upload, if you want to continue with uploading, you can click on start upload. Or if you want to change something on the file, you can go to set, if you look at this, if you click on set details. So, Basically, it will, it will ask you whether you want to use the standard storage or the infrequent access storage. And there is another class of storage called as reduced redundancy storage, right? Reduced redundancy storage is going away shortly. So that's the reason they don't have much description about uh, reduced redundancy storage in uh, S3 page. But S3, uh, reduced redundancy storage is the is, is same like uh, S3 storage. The main difference being the durability of the data is only 99.99%. Whereas the S3 storage has a durability of 99.99 like this level 9 site. Right? But the difference with, with reduced tendency storage is the durability of the data is only 99.99%. So 
So if you if you think that the files are not very important, and if you are okay losing some files, then you can go for reduced redundancy storage, or else you can go for either uh, standard storage, or if you think that the file that you are going to upload to a S3 bucket is very infrequently accessed, then you can go with this. I'll go with the standard storage for now. And if you want to encrypt the file, the file that you are uploading into S3 storage, right? I want even after I upload the file also the file to be in an encrypted format on the disk. Then I can go for this, but I'm not going to go for an encrypted format. I'm going for a standard storage, normal way, and set permissions, right? I can click on set permissions now. Now, uh, grant me full control as I'm uploading it. If I want, if I want to have uh, full control, I have to click this. And if I can make everything public, we'll look at that shortly. Uh, set metadata, right? If you want to do a, a, a metadata of the file, what is metadata? Metadata is nothing but information about the file, right? If you want to, if you if you are using some weird extensions which are not generic. Right? If you are if you are using some uh, new extensions of the file which are not generic, and if you still want to classify the data, like say I'm, a, I'm normally JPEGs are pictures, PDFs are uh, files, right? Unreadable documents, uh, uh, unreadable documents. Uh, MP3s are audio files. You know what what of looking at the extension, you will be able to make it what the content of it, right? So if you have an extension like say ABC as an extension and if there is no standard format of it and if you want to specify what content type it does you can go for adding a metadata but let's leave that you can simply click on figure out the content type automatically and click on start upload so what it is doing now is it is uploading the file it is uploading the file that I have created Right, now my file is uploaded. Now my file is uploaded. Now if I click on properties, right now it will show me the properties of the file. Right? Now it will show me the properties of the file. So each object that you upload into an S3 bucket, this is very important. Each object that you upload into an S3 bucket has a independent URL. Right? Every bucket that you upload into S3 storage has a URL. If I click on this, I'm not able to see this file because I haven't given permissions. And if you see, when if you look at it here, it has a lock symbol. If I want, if I want this to be accessible from anywhere in the world for everyone, I I can simply come to click on permissions, add more permissions, and I can choose say, uh, I can choose what everyone, what type of permissions I want to give. I want to give open download, and I want to give view permissions. I save this. Now these permissions are saved. Now if I do a refresh of the page, now if I look at properties, you see the link has changed. Earlier it was a lock, right? Now it has changed to a like a symbol like a RSS suite. Now if I click on it, it will open the PDF. Right? We are able to open the PDF. We are able to access this file. Even you guys can. Even you guys should be able to access this link, right? Anybody can access it because in the permissions I said everyone. That means make. I said make it public. Okay. If you want to look at details about what storage it is, and if you want to change it, if you want to change it, you can do that. If I click on save, right now the file type has changed it changed to standard infrequent access. You can look at this here. If I click on properties, now if I want to change it back to standard storage, I can do it. Okay. Now the file storage class. Storage class has changed to standard. If you want to encrypt the file, you can encrypt the file. By, but that, that needs uh, now the file is encrypted, right? Now the file is encrypted. But that needs some configuration as well if you want to decrypt the file and all those stuff. Now if you try to access it, probably you should be able to see it for now. But if you want to properly encrypt it, then you have to have a more keys and all of that stuff, right? So 
there's nothing much that you can do with the files but there is a lot of stuff that you can do with the bucket we'll, we'll have a look at the bucket stuff <coughs> with the files all you can do is you can look at transfers that will show you basically what all files have been uploaded and what all what all things that you have been doing on the buckets then you have details about the bucket like like who is the owner of the bucket when when uh, sorry like who is the owner of the file when when was this file created size of the file and the link and all of those details and if you go into metadata right it, it is content type application pdf right if you upload something like a jpeg it will say image jpeg if you upload something like a tiff image or a bmp image it will, it will choose this automatically so nothing much to do here just click on cancel right so let's get back to buckets let's look at let's look at this part so what will what you can do is you can upload files right so let's download a couple of images let's quickly download a couple of images AWS. Now look, save save this uh, save this image with the name of say Arch, any name. I'm quickly saying a couple of files there just to show you how it works. I want to check this image also. Right. Uh, say. I'm at arch one, right? Arch one dot arch one. So I have two image files, right? I have two image files downloaded into my S3 bucket. If uh, downloaded into my folder, if I want to upload them into my S3 bucket, I can simply click on actions, right? Upload, add files, select what you want to upload. I want to upload both of these files. Open. So if I'm, what I'm doing is I'm uploading two files at a time. Click on set details and click on set permissions. If I want to make these files public, I can select this and click on start upload. Right, I have uploaded these two files. Now if I look at properties, properties of the files. Now these are links. As soon as I click on the link, it will take me to the image. Right, because these are on my S3 bucket. This is as expected. There's nothing unusual in it. It is as expected. Now let's come back to bucket properties, right? Let's look at, let's start with looking from permissions. Okay. So once you, uh, once you upload, uh, once you upload a file into a, a, a bucket, you can put some restrictions on it. We'll, we'll try to look at that now. If you want to have more people accessing this. If you if you want to have more people accessing this, or people uh, like you, if you want logging enabled or all of that stuff, you have something called as add permissions. This doesn't have much stuff in here, but if you want to enable log delivery, you can go for this, right? If you want to enable logging on this bucket, right? So you have to go for this. Other than this, the important and interesting thing here is bucket policy, right? When you look at this, add bucket policy. Okay, like yesterday we were talking about IAM, right? In a similar way, you can also create bucket policies, right? You can restrict access to a bucket. If I click on sample bucket policies, it's going to throw, throw me up some policies, right? If I want to uh, specify certain things, like if I want to only few users to give access to my bucket, okay? I can have something like this, effect, principle, action resource right so if i want to give access only from a specific ip address also i can do that right principle means 
user basically which user effect what do you want to do you want to allow action s3 star what does that mean is allow everything on s3 resource which bucket condition right in this way you can the sample policies but if you don't want to write your own policy you want to use something called as aws policy generator you can click this right yesterday we have used this if you guys have noticed that it will start making sense right what what type of policy we want to write? We want to write a S3 bucket policy. Right? What what do we want to allow or deny? We want to allow. Right? We want to allow what? What do you want to allow? To whom? To which users? I'll say star. Okay. So AWS service that we are going to do under this under the star. What does that mean? Is under the star and for all users, what all you want to allow? Once you have an IAM user, let's quickly create an IAM user. I'll, probably that will be a better approach to show you guys. Probably that will be a better approach to show you guys. So I'll quickly create an IAM user. Come back to it. I think I've deleted most of the stuff that I've created yesterday, so you don't see anything here. So I'll create a user, I'll say user one. Create user credentials. Right? So I'm using those security credentials and I'm going close, close. Right now I have this user created. Right? This user ERN is this one. Right, so what I'm going to do in S3 bucket policy that I'm uh, that I was talking about, I want to give uh, for this user. Say I'm going to go for a policy generator, right? And what I'm saying is, on S3 bucket, what do you want to do? You want to allow or deny? I want to deny this user being what, right? I want to deny what? I want to deny in delete bucket. I don't want this user to uh, say delete object. Okay. And resource ARN is nothing but resource ARN is nothing but sure. It will be like this. Basically, you have to give your S3 bucket name, right? So my S3 bucket name was what? Collabra1234, right? So I can choose this. Collabra1234, right? Now I'm doing this. So what what is denied? For this user, we are saying for this user's specific user, I'm saying deny these two things. I also want to allow all other actions, right? So what I'll do is I'll write another bucket policy. I'll have another statement. Okay, what I'll do is allow. Who should be allowed? This user. What should be allowed? I'll, I'll say uh, all actions and on which bucket and on this bucket. Right? If I do something like this, now what if I click on generate policy? Right? You see this, right? You see a, a policy being generated. I can use this policy. I can copy this policy. If I don't have policy generator, I will have to write this. Right? I should be good at writing policies. Only then I'll be able to use it. But I'm going to use my policy generator, and I've generated this policy. Right? What I said is deny this user on S3. Right? To uh, deny these actions actions these two actions deny on this bucket for this user and I have another in the same statement I said allow everything on this bucket so obviously deny is going to overwrite so this user can list the bucket see the contents you can upload the file but he'll not be able to delete it we'll have a look at it shortly if I click on save Action does not apply to any resource in statement. What is it saying? 
action does not apply to any resource and statement action is equal to delete object. I don't know what to do. Same sort of click on save. Uh, this JSON format you have to be very careful while editing it. Right? It has a lot of syntax, it has a strict syntax. So let's come back here. Let's click on close. Let's remove this. Right, let's click on or else we'll go with only this statement for now. We'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll have a look at uh, the deny in a couple of minutes. For now, we'll, we'll not just get blocked there. We'll go forward with only this one. I'm just allowing everything for this user. Right now, if I click on save, now it is saved. Now I have given a bucket policy for a user of this bucket. So let's see how it works. Right, we'll uh, launch a new institute instance, and then we are going to use those these user credentials to access the bucket. Let's see how it works. Let's quickly launch a EC2 instance. I'm going to launch an instance, configure instance details. I'm going to leave everything default. Launch. My instance is coming up, so let's connect to that instance. IP, let's select the key. I think it's taking some time, so let's retry it. Art is up. So let's log in as easy to use it. And to AWS configure. Right? AWS configure. Enter the access credentials for this user. Enter. And also enter these credentials. Right? Default region is US East hyphen one. US East one. Right now, now I'm now I'm logged into. Now I can talk to my AWS like this user. Right now, if I do AWS S3 LS. AWS S3 LS. Right, so it should have worked, but somehow it's not working. So I'll probably I'll get back to you guys tomorrow or or in the next class. Right, so we'll we'll not get bogged down here for this. Uh, with the policy that I have created, I should have been able to list the contents of this bucket, but somehow it's not happening. So we'll we'll have a look at it later. Uh, probably in the next class before we get into the next session, I'll show you how to do this. Uh, somehow it's not working, so we'll not waste too much time on that. I don't want to troubleshoot now. 
right? So we will not waste too much time on this. But if you want to any, if you want to have some policy like this, like what I defined, you have to go for edit bucket policy, right? All right. So let's look at a couple of other things. Like uh, you can host a website, right? Say I have a website. Uh, normally, uh, you, whenever you uh, browse this smaller site, like small offices or small uh, IT companies or small institutes, right? They have a static page like home, contact us, about us, clients. They have some static content page, right? So if you have a website like that, if you want to host a small website, a static website basically, right? Then uh, you can use S3 buckets to host your website, right? Say I want to have a home page. I want to have a home page. Then three or four static pages like home, about us, contact us, client list, right? If you want to have a small website like that, you can you can host that bucket completely out of the you can host that website completely out of the S3 bucket. So let's see how to do it. All you have to do is you have to come here, click on static website hosting, click on enable website hosting. And so whenever you visit a website, the first page you get that is called as an index document, right? The first page that you see whenever you visit a website that is called as index document, right? So under this bucket, I have two files. Say probably this is my index document. So whenever somebody is trying to visit my website, I want to show this page, right? So then what I'm going to do is, I'm going to click on properties, and I'm going to say enable web hosting, and my index page is arch.png, okay? And whenever somebody is trying to access a page which is not there on my website, right? That will normally hit 404 error, right? You get this page not found errors, right? Instead of giving that, I want to give a standard logo of my company, right? If I'm going to save this. Now, this this will be my website address. Again, you can use this link in your, with your website provider to say that, say whenever somebody is visiting www.abc.com, say if your company name is www.abc.com. So if your DNS, if you're going to talk to your website provider, they can redirect www.abc.com to collabra 1234s 3 website, this website basically, right? So if I'm going to click this, right, as soon as I click that, as soon as I click that, it is taking me to the home page, home page of my, home page of my site. Say this is my website, but now I assume that this is your website. As soon as I click on my website, it is taking me to the home page. Say if I'm trying to access a page which is not there, say for example, about.html. Right? If I'm trying to access a page which is not there, it is immediately taking me to the error page. Right? There's nothing as this one, right? So whatever water whatever all the pages that I'm trying to access, it will always take me to the error page. So this is the standard error that I want to display. For any website that we are talking about, normally you will have a, a home page and a standard error page, right? So if this is my error page. So if I'm trying to access a page which is not there on my website, it's going to consistently take you to this page. But when you try to access your website the first time or any time, it will take you to the home page. Okay, again, say if I have contact us, about us, if I have links here, if I have developed a website, probably I can have a reference of the files in S3 bucket, and I can build a website on it. Okay. Let me try this again. Let me try this again once. I think I am um, able to figure out what I've done wrong here. I'll try that out once. Okay, still it's not working for me. Because um, it should work. Because if you look at it, the, uh, if you look at it, this one, uh, if you remember, guys, I've, I've, I've created this bucket in a different region, Oregon region. Oregon's code is US West 2. And uh, uh, and the standard US East 1 is nothing but the Virginia. 
right? So I'm trying to access that one. So I think I think that's really no, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. So I'm still failing. So I'll look at it again. I'll, I'll look at it and get back to you guys. All right. Uh, all right. So this is how you enable a web hosting out of your S3 bucket, right? If you want to host a complete website, you can do that. You can have your home page here. Then under the home page link, you can have multiple tabs pointing to other S3 files, right? So in this way, you can host completely your website out of S3 bucket. But say, for example, you are doing some maintenance on your website and you want to redirect all the traffic to some other website. Then, say whoever is coming to my website, I want to send them to www.google.com for some time. But click on this. So what's going to happen? It's going to redirect to google.com. Just because I have enabled something called as redirect all requests to another host name, that is what is happening. All right. So that is how you host a uh, S3 bucket. That is how you host a website out of a S3 bucket. Static web hosting. Okay, then you have logging. Uh, like we have seen it while creating the bucket, right? If you want to enable logging, click on enable and under which bucket you want to store your logs. So I want to store logs under uh, so Lambda 1, 2, 3, 4 and I want to have a bucket name like the backup logs, anything. I don't want to go with the default name and I'm going to create a folder. Right? Normally the folders are called as prefixes. So what it is going to do, it's going to create a bucket and it is going to create a folder under this bucket. I click on save. Right? That's what is going to happen. So whenever somebody is trying to access the files in your this bucket, it will automatically create logs in this folder or prefix events. Okay. So if you want to be notified about say whenever somebody is uploading a file or anything like that, you want to be notified about it, you can configure it. Right? Say upload. When do you want to be up, when when do you want to be uh, alerted? When you when, when you want to use your SNS to get alerted. So when whenever somebody is creating an object, right? Under which prefix? Right? Or if you leave this, it will apply for the entire bucket. As I said, prefixes are nothing but the folders inside the bucket. Right? And again, you can say whenever somebody uploads a PDF file, only then alert me. Right? I, I don't care what are the what all other files they upload, I, I'm not bothered. But when whenever somebody creates a PDF file, then alert me. I can have something like that. That is called as normally extensions are called as suffix and the folder names are called as prefix. Okay, if you have anything that specific, you can do that, and you can choose the SNS topic that you want to that you want to use. Right now, do I have a topic in US West? I really doubt. I don't have any any topic in Oregon. So let's create. Let's quickly create a topic in uh, Oregon. I hope you guys remember how we created the SNS topics, right? So all I have to do is I have to click on get started. I have to click on a topic. Then the AWS alerts. Topic name is AWS alerts. And then I will have to add subscribers to it. Create topic. Subscriptions. Create a subscription. And or else I can simply go into this topic. Click on add. select this topic, subscribe to topic and give the email address, right? If I'm going to get emails in the form of, uh, if I want to get the notifications in the form of emails, so select this. So if I'm going to do that, create subscription, right? Now it has created. Now if I'm going to, uh, I think I'll have to do a refresh. I'll have to do a refresh because I've just created a topic, right? So, so if I want to select that, now I'm going to select events. 
my the upload event the name of the event is going to be upload upload event and when you want to upload whenever the new new object is created right AWS alerts is my topic click on save that's fine uh, you have you will have to give a permission for that but that's fine you can ignore that that is how you're going to create events right let's look at something more interesting than that that is called as versioning right if I look at my current uh, current bucket what I have is two files right so what we're going to do is we are going to enable something called as versioning if you enable versioning let's see what's going to happen if I say enable versioning and it throws you a message saying that once you enable versioning you cannot disable it right it says versioning is currently not enabled on this bucket and it will also say that once you enable versioning you cannot control disabling if you want to go for it if you want to go for it click on yes right we have enabled versioning we have enabled versioning now we have two files under this bucket right if you look at it now we have two files let's modify these files let's quickly modify these files in folder I want to change this file I want to change this file like how can I edit I'll do a small modification like I'll have some text or I'll have some text I'll say modified right probably I can have some colors here just to show you that uh, right I have some more text. I have modified this file basically, right? So I'm going to save it. Now I have modified this file and saved it. Now if I'm going to upload the same file again, right? I'm going to apply upload the same file again. I'm going to say the details, search permissions, make everything public, start upload. Right, it has uploaded the file. Now if I look at properties, now if I look at the properties, and now if I look at this file properties, now I have this link. Do we make changes to this one or the other one? I think we make we made the changes to the other one. So let's add file. This file. Click on set details, set permissions, make everything public, start upload. So the second file is also getting uploaded. This file is uploaded. Now if I look at properties, now if I click on this. So this is the modified file, right? There is modified and all of this stuff. So what happened to our earlier file that was there? As I said, I have enabled versioning and once you enable versioning what's going to happen is you're going to get this column here get this two buttons here normally when you look at this other the other bucket and the other bucket contents you don't see these two buttons here right but as i've enabled versioning on this bucket you see these two buttons versions hide and show right if i click on show you see this this file arch2 and arch1 because i, I Upload these two files again, right? Both of the files again. I have both of the versions here. If I click on this, and if I click on properties, if I click on properties. If I click on this one, it's going to show me the earlier version of the file. If I click on this one, I believe the original file could have is everything failing. But right now, okay. Um, this is my current version. So now if I modify the file again and if I try to upload it, right? Say so, uh, before uh, enabling versioning we haven't done so it will not take it. Say I have something like this. I have some I modified the file again. Now if I click on save. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to actions upload add file. I modify this. Set details, set permissions, make public, start upload. Right now it says I have three versions of the file. 
Now if I click on properties. So this is the newer version of the file and this is the older version of the file. Right? So if I look if I don't look at properties, if I click on hide, now as as on when I access this file, it will take me to the newer file. But if I want to retrieve my older file, if you guys remember I haven't enable versioning before uploading the first file. So that's the reason my first version is not there. Okay? But after I uploaded the versioning, after my after my after I enabled the versioning, I have uploaded another version of the file. So that's the reason both the versions are there. Right? So this is one of the version of the file. And now if I want to look at my older file, I can look at this version. Right? This is one version. This is the first version of the file. Right? This is the modified. Right? So this is the new file. So in this way you can have multiple versions of the file. So that even when you upload, uh, when you modify something, you still have multiple versions of the file. Just in case if you delete anything or something like that, you still have files. Right? So the chance of you losing the data will become lesser and as many versions of the, of the file you have, the better it is. Because if you want to retrieve any data, say from that day, say six months back, you can easily do that. But but the only problem is if we have if we have more and more versions of the file, what's going to happen is it's going to consume more and more space. You may think that this file is only consuming 185 KB, but when I actually look at versioning, each file of this is one file is consuming 185 KB, another file is consuming 173 173 KB, and another one is consuming 124 KB. So the size of this file is currently is the sum of all of this. Okay. Versioning is good, but if we have to, so many versions of the file, obviously we'll have to spend more on uh, storage of the data, right? Say for example, if I want to delete this file, I want to delete this file. If I click on delete, file is gone. So what happened to my previous files? I've deleted arch1.png uh, arch file, right? So what happened to my previous version so far? Now if I want to retrieve the file, can I do it? Yes, I can do it. All that I have to do is I have to click on show. Right? And now the current version of the file is this. Now the current version of the file is a delete marker. Right? But there are older versions of the file. The current version is a delete marker. But the older versions of the file are there. Now if I click on properties of the older version, I still have this file. Click on show. Right, this is the older version, and a version before that is this one. Right. So if you enable uh, versioning on a file, if you want to delete that file, you have to delete all the versions of the file. Right. You have to delete all the versions of the file. Only then the file will be deleted. Only then the file will be deleted. But if you if you if you have enabled the versioning and if you simply delete the current version of the file or if you simply delete the file, the the file will actually be still be there. The current version of the file will be delete marker. But the older versions or the previous version of the file will always be there. So you have to be careful with that. Right? So that is for versioning. All right, so let's come back to buckets and let's continue to talk about properties of the buckets. Then you have something interesting called as life cycle. Right? If you look at life cycle, uh, basically say say you say you're storing files in a S3 bucket. You have been storing files from last one year on a S3 bucket. You know that there are some files which you are never going to access, right? Which you barely access. Then uh, you think that if you if you remember we have looked at uh, the glacier storage pricing right glacier storage is very very cheap if you look at this AWS console again there is another service called as glacier storage right and it says archival storage in the cloud so what does that mean is it's a tape storage right so for example if you want to move all the files older than say 60 days onto tape storage or move all the files older than one year onto tape storage and say delete all the files which are older than two years 
I'm never going to use any files which are older than two years. I know that. Then if I'm going to simply keep uploading files into S3 bucket and if I never bother about deleting the files or moving the uh, files to the Glacier storage, I might end up paying more money. Right? If I don't want to do that, I have an option called as lifecycle policies. With lifecycle policies, what you can do is you can set up an automated way of deleting files or moving the files into something called as Glacier storage. Either ways, you save money, right? So let's look at lifecycle rules, how it works. So what you have to do is you have to click on add rule, right? Let's click on add rule. And on which bucket do you want to say, uh, currently I've selected this bucket and I've clicked on add rule, right? Under this bucket, if you want to apply this rule to a specific folder, right? A prefix, a specific folder, you can choose it. But if you want to apply for the end, complete bucket, you can go for that. So, for example, we'll go for the complete bucket, Collabra one two three four. Okay, that is my bucket name. So now I want to configure a rule. Okay, so I want to configure a rule saying that, <coughs> saying that after I create an object, right? After I create an object. So uh, if you look at, if you have noticed this, so for this file that I have created, for the file that I have created, for which I have multiple versions of the file, this file is, this file is called as the current version of the file, and the older versions are called as previous versions of the file. Let's uh, let's quickly upload a couple of more files and try to understand this. Uh, upload, add file, R1. Start upload. Let's modify the file again. Let's modify the file again a bit. Let's use some other color to modify it again this time. So this is some more modifications to the file. Right. So now I'll again click on actions, upload, add file. Right. Now I have. Now I have two versions of the same file, two versions of the file. So the, my current version becomes, my current version, this is my current version, this is my new file. My current version, if I look at my, uh, if I hide it, right, I look up, I look at a 195.7 KB file, right? And if I look at, click on show, my older version is this one. Even if you look at the date also, you can make out, which is the current version and which is the older version, right? The current version of the file is this one. And this is called as the previous version of the file. So when you are writing rules, when you are writing lifecycle rules, you get an option to perform an action on. Uh, you get an option to perform an action on the current version of the file and the previous version of the file. All you have to do is you have to click on Add Rule, and you have to choose which bucket you want to configure the rule on. And here you have two sections: action on current version, action on previous version. Right. Say if I'm uploading a file every day, every day I upload a report, right? Every day I upload a report. But I don't want to uh, say every day I upload a report, but every day I don't want to move that file onto Glacier storage. I just want to move the older versions of the file onto the Glacier storage. Remember, Glacier storage is a tape storage, right? Once you move a file into tape storage, once you move a file into the Glacier storage or the tape storage, if you want to retrieve the file, right? If you want to retrieve the file that is on the tape storage, it is going to take three to four hours. The file will not be available immediately, right? The file will not be available immediately. With the the file which is on Glacier storage is is not online. The file is there; it is really there, but it is not online. So once you upload, once you move a file into uh, Glacier storage, you have to ask for something called as retrieval, right? So what is AWS going to do is AWS is going to take a file, move it into the tape storage, take the tape and store it somewhere, store it somewhere safely. Once you want a file, so what AWS has to do is get the tape, load the load the tape again, and get your data back. 
So all of these operations are going to take at least three to four hours. So before moving a file into Glacier storage, make sure that you don't need that file online at any given point of time. You make sure that you don't need that point or uh, note you don't need that file online every minute. Only move the files for which you can wait for three to four hours. Say I have a photos of two years old, right? I have so many photos now. I use I use a digital camera, right? I have so many photos. I have, I have photos older than two years also, lying on my hard lying on my hard drive, right? Obviously, hard disk space is expensive. But what I can do is I can move all of those photos which are older than two years into my Glacier storage, which is very very cheap. You look at this, the cost of Glacier storage is very very less per GB. So what I can do is I can move all of my older pictures into Glacier storage, and then when I want to see those files, I can wait. To, I can easily wait for three to four hours, right? Three to waiting for three to four hours to get all of my storage back is not a big thing. If you have something like that, only then move the files into Glacier storage, right? Okay. <coughs> so what should be done on the files, right? So what should be done on the current version of the files. So after you upload a file, after you upload a file, transit, as, it, as we have noticed, right, there are three different classes of storage, right? Standard storage, standard infrequent access, the reduced redundancy storage, and then there is another storage class called as Glacier storage, which is nothing but the tape storage, right? So whenever I upload a file, right, whenever I upload a file, after how many days you want to move the file into infrequent access storage class. If you guys remember the pricing chart that what we have looked at for Amazon S3, now it will all come, now it will all make more sense. Let's look at the pricing chart again. Right? Let's look at the pricing chart again. If you look at it, Amazon S3 storage is some 30 cents per GB, right? Sorry, this is some three cents per GB. Amazon S3 infrequent access is 1.25 cents per GB, right? So this is cheaper. So if you are going to store files on S3 storage, you can store them. But if you are going to have some files which you not access very frequently, probably it is better idea to move them onto infrequent access storage, right? So now you can get to define after how many days you want to move the files into infrequent storage. If I select this, right, it, it shows me an example. Say today is October 17, 2015, right? Say if I'm going to say 30 days, right? Here in this box, if I'm going to say 30 days, what's going to happen is on November 16, 2015, the file that I upload today will be moved into, automatically will be moved into something called as infrequent access. So what's going to happen then is, What's going to happen then is, uh, if I look at my console again, right? I have two files in, under this bucket, so I'll just quickly want to show you. Right. Uh, if you look at the storage class, it's standard, right? If I'm going to deploy this rule, if I'm going to use this rule, so what's going to happen is after 30 days, the storage class it's standard right now. After 30 days, this storage class is going to change into standard infrequent access. So that will save money. Depending on your requirement, you can choose the number of days. Say so I am not going to use any file regularly. I want to move. I want to move every file after 30 days. Right? So minimum looks to be 30 days. So that uh, you cannot move a file less than 30 days. So 30 days after 30 days, you can move a file into something called as standard entry print access, right? Fine. You can move a file into standard entry print access. After moving the file into standard infrequent storage, right? Right? So how many days you want to wait before moving the file into Glacier storage? If I say 90 days, what's going to happen is today's day zero, right? So after 30 days, your file is going to go into standard storage infrequent access storage, which is cheaper. And after 60 more days, from today it is 90 days, right? 
from today it is 90 days on the 90th day the files are going to be moved into something called as glacier storage which is even cheaper storage right which is even cheaper storage so if you want to automate something like this you have life cycle tools that is what we are looking at that is one of the feature of s3 storage okay then you get to have a expiry also say if i'm going to say something like this. Okay, expiry cannot be less than. Right, so what's going to happen is the file in your S3 bucket after 30 days will be moved into uh, standard entry fund storage. After 90 days, the file will be moved into glacier storage. After 120 days, the file will even be deleted from the glacier storage. Right, the current version of the file will be deleted. So, a delete marker or delete marker will be placed for the current version of the file right but if you want to retrieve the file retrieve the older version of the file the older version of the file is still there in glacier storage okay so this is one of the rule this is the rule on the current version you can also have rules on the rules on the previous versions like i have two files here like on this i can have a separate rule for this one and i can have a separate rule for this one this is my current version and this is my previous version. So with the previous version, with the current version, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm telling it to move to a S3 infrequent storage, then move to glacier storage, and then mark the current version as previous version. Right? So once the file is moved as a previous version, what do you want to do? Action to the again, the previous versions of the file, what do you want to do? Move it to, to uh, probably if you, it is not it is not mandatory that you should use for you should use all of the three rules you can use any one of them or depending on your requirement you can do it right so i just want to delete it i want to delete all of my previous versions of the file say after 20 days i can have this okay so as soon as i upload a file after 20 days right after 20 days file will be completely deleted right if I want I can have that we'll go for a standard to something like this right you can have a rule any which way any 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 way that makes sense to you you can have it right so I'm going with this on review rule name move any name that you want to have you can create and activate to it. Right? So that's going to happen, but we have to come back after so many days to see the rule into rule into action. Right? But we can, we cannot I don't think we're going to come back after that time. But you can have rules like this. Right? You can have rules like this. If you want to add another rule, you can do that. On the same bucket, say one rule I want to apply for PDFs. All the PDFs I want to all the PDFs, JPEGs, which are which are not, not frequently written. Say, for example, if you are looking at log files, log files will keep frequently changing, right? But if you look at something like a PDF or a JPEG, which don't change, which don't change very often, so I want to apply separate rules on them and separate rules on uh, log files. I can go for another rule for a say, for example, I have a bucket like slash log. I have I have another folder in bucket like this name. Uh, then I can have a separate rule for that. I can definitely have a separate rule for that. So I don't want to have any file holder then. Right? I can have something like this. So what's going to, what it's going to do is it's going to expire the file on with the very same day or I can after one day my file will be expired so a delete marker will be placed so after on the same uh, probably I can have one here so after the very next day the file will be deleted also if I want to have something like this so I don't want any logs older than one day I don't need it right so I can have something like this 
Okay. I can have something like that. So based on your requirement, you can write your own life cycle rules. Once you have your life cycle rules, the data will be automatically moved into one storage class to another storage class to help you save money. Right? You can do that. Then you have the last thing that we are going to look at in S3 buckets is called as cross region replication. Right? If you guys have noticed this, this bucket is created in Oregon. Right? All the content that I uploaded upload in this bucket will be uh, easily and fastly accessible in Oregon. Right? But I have most of my servers in so Sydney. Right? I have S3 bucket in Oregon, but I want the same, uh, say for example, I want the most of my servers in Sydney. And if most of those servers are going to access files from this S3 bucket, it's going to be very late. Right? So then what I can do is I can go for something called as cross-region cross replication. Right? If you enable cross-region replication, right? If you enable cross region replication, what's going to happen is I have to say which bucket, the bucket name is this. And if you want to enable cross region replication for only a specific folder, you can do that. Under this region, say I want to uh, say that all the files should be. So whenever I upload a file here in this bucket, the file should be automatically visible in a bucket in Sydney. So I can choose a bucket or create a new bucket. Right. I can say for one, two, three, four, Sydney. Okay. There is my bucket name. So even in Sydney, which type of storage you want to store the files in? Right? I want to store in S3. Simply click on this button, this will automatically create an IAM role which allows files to be copied from one region to another region. Simply click on enough, there is nothing much to do. Click on save. Right? As soon as I save it, now if I do a refresh of the page, you see that there is another bucket created. Right? You see that there is another bucket created by name Sydney. Right? Now if you look at cross region duplication, it says if you want to again enable cross region duplication, you can enable from this bucket to another bucket. But now if you come back to this, to Libra 1, 2, 3, 4, now if you click on properties, and now if you can cross region duplication, it says it is currently enabled and the destination is this. And so let's see what does this mean. Right? Now Libra 1, 2, 3, 4 has these two files there. Okay, so let's what let's, let's, let's upload a file. Let's upload a file into this bucket. Click on Add files. So I want to upload this PDF. Click on set it is. Click on set permissions. So I want to access this file over internet. So like make sure that you give make everything public. Click on start upload. We have uploaded the file into this bucket, right? But we also have something called as cross region duplication enabled. So now if I go into my Sydney, right? Sydney has this. I have uploaded file into this bucket, but the file is automatically uploaded also into this bucket. So all the files that you're going to upload into this bucket will be automatically be replicated into this bucket. And what you have to remember is if there are any files that are already existing in there those files will not be replicated. Only the new files that you are going to create, only they will be replicated. The existing files will cannot be replicated, but all the new files can be replicated and will be replicated. You don't have to do anything. All you have to do is you have to enable something called as cross region replication. After that, you upload a file into the source. Uh, it will probably, you can call it as a, like a parent child, right? You, apply, uh, you upload into a parent. Uh, then it will automatically visible in the child if you want to call it like that, but I don't prefer like that. 
So that is what is cross region duplication. Okay. So there is nothing much other than that, that we are going to talk about in here. So that's that's pretty much as S3 storage. And so that's pretty much as S3 storage. If you guys have any questions, you can raise your hand and then we'll take the question and then we'll go forward. Okay, all right, so we'll go forward. We'll also try to look at place storage, right? So, so what we looked at was uh, we have enabled place storage, right? In the S3 bucket, in the S3 bucket, we have seen how to use a place storage, right? So we have seen, we have seen how to move files, how to write rules which will move files from your S3 storage to place storage. But your Glacier storage doesn't need to be used only from S3 bucket only. You can also move from your laptop also files into Glacier storage. Like you move files into your Dropbox, right? You move files into Dropbox and the files go into the S3 bucket. In a similar way, you can have some utilities which can help move files into Glacier storage. If you want to do something like that, right? If you want to do something like that, all you have to do is you have to you have to click on get started and create a vault. Create a vault. Right, say my vault. Any any name that you like. Next steps. If you, if you want to enable notifications, whenever somebody uploads a file or anything like that, you want to enable notifications, you can select that. If you don't want to enable notifications, you can ignore that. Or if you want to enable notifications, and if you want to create a new SNS topic, you can go for that. If you want to enable notifications and use the existing SNS topic, you can choose that. But for that, you will need your SNS topic in this region. I think I have SNS topic in this region. Let me go back here. I guess I have this. Right, so I can choose this ARM. Remember guys, yesterday we were talking about ARMs, right? So, all that I'm going to do, I'm going to paste this file here. And so when do you want to uh, be notified? Whenever there is a retrieval complete. So once I upload a file into a DLC storage, I also want to retrieve the object. Uh, as I said, as I said, uh, Glacier storage is a tape storage, right? So once you upload a file into the tape storage, you also want to retrieve it. As soon as you retrieve it, you want to be notified about it, right? If you want something like that, you can go for this. And whenever uh, uh, vault inventory, whenever it retrieves the complete vault, if you look at it, it says when retrieving the data from an Amazon place here, right? It, it, it clearly says, if you click on this, if you bring your mouse, on, mouse pointer into that, it says when retrieving data from Amazon place here, you initiate a retrieval job, which typically concludes to help you automate your data retrieval, you can set completion of this, right? It will just simply send you a message. If you want to enable something like that, you can click yes, if I click on submit. Right now what I have is a vault created, right? From here, there's nothing much that you can do with the vault, right? There's nothing much that you can do with the vault, but if you want to use this vault storage, you can definitely do it, right? All, all you have to do is you have to use uh, some uh, graphical utilities, right? We have fast place here and other tools which you can download, right? Place here, right? There is something called as fast place here. So once you download this tool and install this tool, I have to give account name and all of this stuff. So for this, what I'll do is I'll like quickly go over here, go over into my SNS. 
and I'll create an admin user. I'll add a user. I'll create a new user. By name say admin. Access these to the user. So it's a credentials. I'm going to use these credentials to log into my Glacier storage. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to attach a policy so that he can access the Glacier storage. Otherwise, otherwise this user will not be able to access the Glacier storage. Or else I have to give a specific rule. For this user to access the glacier storage. So, for example, I'm going to keep to do this. So for this user, he has access to glacier. Okay. Now, what we have to do is you have to give an account name, say any name that you want. My glacier. And then you have to choose your uh, secret access chain account. Right. So, what we are choosing here. Here, right? Click on add new account. And if you look at it, this is the world that I have created. Right? This is the world that I have created. Somebody has a question. Do you have a question, Bharti? If you have a question, you can raise your hand. Okay. Yes, Bharti. Uh, actually, just now you downloaded a, a tool for a glacier. What did you do that of tool? Sorry? Uh, just now you downloaded a tool, right? For a yeah. glacier. Fast glacier. So what, fast glacier, yes. Uh, yes. What did you do of that tool? You attached to that policy? No, no, no. Uh, this is just a piece of software, right? So after you download this software, right? So, so I have I've installed some software on my machine. Now, if I want to access this software from, uh, say, this is a front-end tool to access your Glacier storage. But if you want to act, if you want to interact with your AWS infrastructure from this storage, from this tool, you have to give some credentials, right? So these are the credentials through which I'm accessing. Uh, these are the credentials which I'm putting in this my storage to access the vault or the Glacier storage. Okay. Okay. You get that? Okay. Yes. This is a different software altogether, and from this software, if I have to access the vault that I have created here, it I need to give a username and password, right? Okay. So those username and password is nothing but these credentials. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So you have your vault here, right? This is my vault. If I want to upload, if I want to move any files into this place is true, I can do that. Right? I can definitely move files into my Glacier storage. I want to move these two files into my Glacier storage. So these two files are moved into the Glacier storage. In this way, you can use this software, right? By default, this uh, AWS console doesn't have many features for uh, doesn't have many features on uh, to access uh, AWS. Sorry access the glacier properly but you have to use one of these tools right or you have to write your own command line scripts through which you can interact with glacier storage okay so that's pretty much with glacier storage as well i wanted to talk about cloud front as well but you guys have any questions Okay, we don't have, you guys don't have any questions. I'm not sure if I want to start up with CloudFront. 
with only 20, 15 minutes left. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll look at CloudFront also in the next next week, right? Not a problem. We'll look at CloudFront and probably RDS stuff in the next week. Do you guys have any, any questions before we wrap it up for the day? Anybody has any questions, they can ask. Otherwise, I'll close the, close the class for today. All right, I don't see any hands going up, so I assume you guys don't have any questions. As usual, if you guys have any questions, you can email me at vishnuaws.com, sorry, vishnuaws at gmail.com, or you can uh, send your queries to collaborate team as well. Right? So I'll, I'll talk to you guys next week. See you guys. Have a good week ahead. Bye. Please.